they are the prog rock CSN. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Trying to keep their solo careers alive. <laughs> yeah, like three guys whose <laughs> bands wouldn't have them because they were such dildos, so they could only have each other. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of 1001 Album Complaints, the show where lifelong friends and musicians break down a classic album from Robert Dimery's list of 1001 albums you must hear before you die. We're going to go through the backstory of this band, how this album came to be. We're going to play clips of these songs, so if you haven't listened to it in a while or are unfamiliar with it, don't worry. We're going to get you up to speed. And... I should mention right out front, we are going to make fun of this band. So if you're listening because you are an ELP super fan, get ready. We are going to have some snarky takes. We're going to poke a little fun. We're fans of music. We respect anyone who puts themselves out there and puts pen to paper or song to tape. But it's fun to make fun of the little things. And I think there's plenty on this record to poke a bit of fun at and have some laughs about. So... Get ready for that. We're going to kick this one off with a quote from the original Rolling Stone review of this album. It reports, This album records the failure of three performers to become creators. Regardless of how fast and how many styles they can play, ELP will continue churning out mediocrity until they discover what, if anything, it is that they must say on their own. You know because you clicked... But we're talking, of course, about ELP's Tarkus. That's Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, their second studio release called Tarkus. Just to get you in the headspace of what we've been listening to all week, we're going to play a snippet from the, the title track, which also occupies the entire first side. It is called Tarkus. Okay, and now that we got that out of the way, we're going to introduce everyone who's here on the call with us, including a special guest. We're going to get to him momentarily. I would love to hear how everyone's week went in the form of a tweet-length review, and we're going to throw it first to Tom. Hey, everybody. This is Tom. And you know how people are always saying, like, Mozart probably had ADHD, and if you medicated him, he never would have made his masterpieces. I think this album makes a compelling case for medicating your children. Fair enough. Fair (laughs) enough. Okay. Uh, We're going to kick it over to Marty next. All right. How's it going? Short and sweet here. Tarkus, to me, sounds like the musical equivalent of three dudes jacking off at the same time. (laughs) And you know what that sounds like. I do. <laughs> Obviously. Okay. Em- Emer- Emerson Lake and Bukaki. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Shots fired, literally. <laughs> okay. 
And we're going to throw it now to our special guest, Dave Gebro of the Discography Podcast. Give us your tweet length review, Dave. It's borderline unimaginable that a concept album about an armadillo tank was FM radio gold at one point. Back then, they were full on classical loving, blowjob getting rock stars. But if this thing came out today, not only would they all have day jobs guaranteed, but their co workers would be bullying all three of them. <laughs> so true Good one. so true okay and just to round things out this is rob here i'm gonna be walking us down elp lane and my tweet length review is if odd time is your idea of a good time you still might think this album is a bit much get ready to listen to what prog rock haters the world over are talking about when they plead with you to please put something anything else on the stereo oh good lord Okay, before we segue into general impressions, I wanted to throw the mic over to Dave, our special guest. Tell us a little about Discography and what you guys are doing over there. It's a great podcast, but I'd love to hear it from your own words. Thanks. Uh, this has been a runaway train. The story of Discography is intense. It is a podcast for music obsessives. It originally kind of started as myself and a good friend of mine, Joe Kennedy, but it kind of just became myself. It is a podcast based on the way that I listen to music, which is an entire discography taken in at one time so that you you actually get the the distinction, the I think a touched and honored distinction of being being able to look from a bird's eye perspective at the entirety of an artist's releases and get to know an artist in a way that they probably don't have any self-awareness about because they don't listen to their own music. So I have typically musical luminaries, but also filmmakers and authors come on, we pick a band, uh, typically their favorite, and we go through everything and rate every last release from zero to five. What it has become, though, is the brand has become... Uh, sort of home of the epic interview that's cut up into a series. So right now it's a 13 hour interview with the two founding members of the association going through and doing what I call a hot seat episode. So they're actually rating their own shit, which is intense. Oh man. It gets intense. Like Bob Nastanovich rating all of pavement stuff, David Paho rating slint. What it does is it disarms the lifelong musician, you know, musician who's got his guard up. He's reduced to a music fan again. Uh, kind of like this kind of setup, you know, dudes just hashing it out. And when the defense has come down, because it's reconnecting with that that thing that we had when we were young, that's when I go in and I do an interview with them and then go back to the discography. Nice. Yeah, I, I love the podcast. Recommend everyone, all our music obsessive fans, because we definitely run in similar waters. Go check it out. It's definitely totally. a different concept. But I love the concept, looking at that whole discography. Just one other quick thing is that I put up three shows a week. There's a Friday show that's free, and then I have a very active Patreon where there's a Monday show and a Wednesday show as well, and everything is thematically interwoven. So it's a deep dive, just the way us music obsessives love it. The Friday show is echoed by the Monday and Wednesday shows. They're all interlinked. Yeah, you've done some really interesting pieces recently, and I have to admit, from afar, I have been amazed at your output. It's pretty wild. I don't know how you do anything else because you also do the deep dive into the research. I was listening to the episode you did on the band and you were going deep on singles they were doing as the Hawks and even pre-Hawks and right. going through really every step of the way. So it is, it's impressive. It's got to be comprehensive. If it's not, it's just a fucking waste of time as far as I'm concerned. I'm doing Mark Robinson right now. So Unrest, Air Miami. I don't know if you guys know uh, his stuff. He, He's amazing. My notes right now are over 100 pages, and I have about a week and a half left to go. Well, we can only hope to compare uh, on tonight's podcast, but I'll tell you what, after hearing that idea of listening to an entire band's discography, I think everyone would agree that that is a good way to get a bird's eye view of what's really going on. As we know from this podcast, right, it can be really hard in the course of a week, listening to only one record to get the full context and let alone not having lived through the time period and all the other music that was going on. But I have to say, in this particular instance, 
I am super glad that I did not have to listen to every Emerson, Lake, and Palmer <laughs> disc that has ever come out. The way discography is set up is it's modeled after the way I've been listening to music for years. So in full disclosure, I have done an ELP trawl for fun on my own before the show. I know everything they've done. And so when you were reading that Rolling Stone review, I know how their career ends and it's sad and funny as, as a lot of their, you know, their history has proven to be sad and funny. It's pompous, it's bloated, but there's a, a weird sadness to it as well. Uh, there's, it's interesting. I was just, I just did an interview. I was lucky enough to get an interview with the editor of Mojo magazine today. He would not be snarky about anything. He would not rank anything i guess like wading in the waters that that you guys and myself wade in for for long enough and you just you can't take it anymore and you just want to <laughs> have a beatific glow towards all that you hear or try to yeah. you know but so this is going to be an interesting uh <laughs> yeah flip well well let's let's get right into general impressions of Tarkus. And and listen, I think the place we're coming from as our listeners know is is one of respect ultimately. If you're going to say you don't like something, I think you need to have a rationale behind it similar for why you do like things and it's just more interesting to have an opinion. So Tom, what would you think about the week, buddy? Well, I mean this album is certainly starts off as pretty inaccessible. When you first are listening to that epic Tarkus what six part song or whatever it is, it is quite the journey through a, a weird story that they say has some meaning to it. I don't know. I don't know what the hell they're talking about there, but it's a showcase of virtuosic playing. But I didn't find that the motifs that they were coming back to were solid enough for it to really keep my attention and keep it super compelling. My first note was this band needed a John Anderson from Yes to write those really compelling vocal parts that could have been a piece that would have tied it all together a lot more. Instrumentation-wise, fantastic playing, stuff that I could never hope to emulate. But I don't think that the songs coalesced as compelling songs in the way that I would have liked them to. I'm not saying that it was all bad. I actually really like Greg Lake's voice. I think that he has a fantastic timbre to his voice. It makes me wonder if on the court of the Crimson King, Fripp was giving him some melody writing help because I didn't find the vocal melodies to be particularly compelling either. And I know, overall, I found myself getting lost during the long song. And then some of the other songs, the shorter songs, seemed almost kind of pointless at times. I didn't quite understand what they were sort of going for. It was definitely a mishmash of different genres for the second side of the album. So overall, it was a confusing week for me. I was a little confused as to what they were trying to go for. You should have reached out, brother. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Wait, we're going we're gonna to get to you momentarily. But yeah, I mean, I have to agree with some of what you said, Tom. It just felt a little bit... I think my main complaint about it is that it oftentimes felt like an exercise. Like, you're just throwing musical concepts at the wall because you can. And there wasn't the cohesion that I have come to expect from other prog rock. And I think of myself as pretty into the genre of prog rock, not an aficionado, but I'm pretty tolerant of some pretty out there music of this sort. And you're right. I think melodically, it just wasn't, wasn't that great. Plus some of the song choices ultimately undermined the idea that they were serious in some sense. So that's sort of where I'm coming from. But there were definitely some cool passages, some cool parts, some stuff to like here. And we're going to get into those. It's funny because I, I saw a little video documentary about them and they hated being called a power trio. But if they hate being called a power trio so much, they shouldn't make an album like this. And there's something else about this album that annoys me in the, in the same way that for some reason, like I get annoyed by Cream and I get annoyed by the Jimi Hendrix experience sometimes. It's just the trio format sometimes feels like it's missing something, especially when there's no guitar. And this album, it just feels like people, just, they're just like playing at each other. They're all playing at the same time, the same notes. It's just kind of annoying. Even their other albums at least have, have more like orchestration and guitar. And this one doesn't. Another thing is the song lengths. You know, you could have one song that's 25 minutes long and then like a couple songs that are like less than two minutes long. And some of them sound like they were just made up like, like, okay, let's make up a song right now. One, two, three, go. Press record and put it on the album. 
It lacks a little bit for me. Dave, what do you think? I'm happy to call you the ELP expert in the room based on what you said <laughs> earlier. So, so have at it. Refute some of those points if you like or add to them. Well, the thing with ELP is you got to take the bloated with the good. And so to me, they are possibly the most fun of the uh, the more successful prog bands because they're, it's so ridiculous. I mean, it's no matter how they feel about it, it's impossible to take a concept album about an armadillo tank, which none of the band members could explain to you. Uh, none of them know what it means. It's hard to not have a sort of, oh, like that kind of a vibe to it because it almost feels like an alternate universe where a record like this could come out and be in the top 10 and go gold within the same season. Forget about year. It went to number one in the UK. And, uh, and, to, and to your point, which is so super valid, yeah, the songs on the second side were made up on the spot because they got to the studio and they only had Tarkus written. And so they banged out a few, you know, douchey numbers to because you can't have a, a side B that's blank. You you could if you were going to release a Billy Joel's greatest hits would have two blank sides. <laughs> oh. <laughs> River of Dreams is a great album. Come on, <laughs> yeah, just for the sheer antiquity of of something like this being as popular as it was, it, it makes me you know very nostalgic for a different time. Definitely, and so let's 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 start talking about that time. Certainly, but ultimately, what we're here to do is assess whether or not we feel, and we're going to vote on it, whether we feel this is an absolute necessity to listen to before you die. And so I would love to hear, I'm ready to be convinced, but I'm on the fence right now. Tom, please. Oh, I was just going to say, this is the music that lacks the most in soul of any album that we have listened to so far. There is absolutely no soul on this album. And I mean that in the sense of there's no soul like Delta Blues, you know, Black Man Trouble soul. And there's no soul like it seems like it is a little bit manufactured. Um, it's a fucking it's like music by robots for robots or for gigantic ass nerds. And it is kind of mind boggling that at one point all the kids <laughs> were, I guess, at the, at a party on your parents were out of town. They got a keg and they're lighting up some doobies and playing this as like their makeout music or something. I don't get it. I that would not have ever occurred to me to do that. The other way to look at this also is 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 seeing it live, you know, where they're shooting off cannons into the crowd and and going sure. crazy, you know. That's where I can envision it being thrilling. Oh, a million percent. I would never listen to a Guar album, but Guar is a fantastic band to see live. Exactly. Yeah, you don't have to wear the plastic raincoats over your head when you're at home listening to them. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it's, it is accurate because ELP really thought of themselves as a live band first, and they didn't spend a lot of... It didn't seem like from my the interviews I read and what I read about them that they put a lot of time and effort to that idea of using the studio as an instrument. Emerson was interested in getting new sounds, obviously, and it was a synth pioneer. But they kind of saw it as a means to an end. They thought the live show was the thing, and it was really important to them that they were able to recreate everything they were doing live as a trio. So we're gonna, let's talk about that. Let's talk about that background, which I think their background as a band and why this was so popular in the time period it came out is a little bit of the history of prog rock itself. So take your mind back to the 60s, and this word progressive was being thrown around in a lot of different contexts, hadn't really solidified to progressive rock, the meaning we might have it. Today, it just meant... I'm going to take it all the way back to the 60s. <laughs> yes, please, please yeah. do. There we go. <laughs> At that time, being progressive was a variety of things that were just about pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable in pop music. Right, It meant a lot of different things, but there were a couple things happening simultaneously, as I, I'm sure all of us know, but it's worth mentioning for the listeners. One, recording equipment was getting better and cheaper, as was the studio time itself, and so there was just more ability to have experimentation. At the same time, the culture was changing, not the least of which for the drug LSD, which was expanding people's minds and changing the nature of what pop music can do. Now, Initially, this idea of progressive rock was supposed to be about borrowing classical music ideas to use them to expand on pop music. But the reality is that term is never, there's never one way to define what, what this genre has been. 
And so I was looking through the history of prog rock as part of my journey this week, and hearing a lot of people cite, I was somewhat surprised, Sgt. Pepper. Maybe it's not surprising, right? That Sgt. Pepper is... It's the Sgt. Peppers of prog rock albums because it set a template. It transformed, in, in the words of Bill Bruford, famous prog drummer from Yes and King Crimson and other bands, he said, Sgt. Pepper transformed both musicians' ideas of what was possible and audiences' ideas of what was acceptable in music. So it created a big ripple effect, right, in the UK as well as eventually in, in America, but particularly in the UK. You had this early scene Bands like the Moody Blues, Caravan, and a band called The Nice, right? That were starting to take on some of these ideas and experiment. The Nice contained one, Keith Emerson. And that band was doing pretty well. But the reality is this genre took a few years to mature. A lot of the bands that became prog rock touchstones released their debut album between like 1968 and 1970. But usually, with a couple exceptions that I'll mention, that first record was actually not very prog rock. It was, it was much more folky, or you know, it took them time to develop into that. The two exceptions I can think of are the first Yes album and the first King Crimson album, which has already been referenced because Greg Lake was the singer and bass player in King Crimson. I should mention both of those albums came out in 1969, Right, And so we're leading up to Greg Lake and Keith Emerson meeting, which also happens in 1969. I'd also like to posit that Court of the Crimson King is the greatest prog rock album of all time. You know, it's funny because I was curious to sanity check myself after all this ELP this week. Instead of listening to the rest of the ELP discography, which I touched on a bit, I went and listened to some other prog rock touchstones. And that was one of the ones I listened to all the way through. And I was blown away by how much better it is than this, frankly. The orchestration is much more nimble. The melodies, it just, it still moves and is moving despite having all these wild musical ideas embedded in it. There's a fire uh, that the the guys, you know, you guys are talking about, you know, three guys masturbating whilst looking away from each other. And King Crimson <laughs> are in such lockstep rhythm that it's almost scary sometimes. Uh, I really, during sections of the record, you feel like you're in the presence of a force that you don't typically come across in music. Well, I would say that, especially with King Crimson, who I am a big fan of King Crimson. I actually personally think that Red is my favorite prog rock album of all time. But what King Crimson does is they bring that insane musicality to songs. And I feel like a lot of the stuff that ELP is bringing to the table don't rise to the level of songs. They don't have a core of a musical through, through line that they then intersperse this crazy instrumentation on top of it's just the crazy instrumentation without that root of a really good song yeah they kind of they kind of smash things together that maybe maybe don't belong and also close to the edge by yes is the best prog rap <laughs> honestly that would be the only one that could breathe the same rarefied air i think that record is perfect it really is <laughs> right, right. Hey, can we talk about just for one second the <clears throat> the when Rob and I went to go see Yes uh, at the in the basement of the Silver Legacy Casino in Reno, Nevada, in like 2010 or something like that. Ouch! And what were they were supposed to play? The Yes album and Fragile. What were the, was it? The Fragile, the Yes album, and no, Fragile was the one they weren't gonna play. I think they were supposed to play. Oh, they were gonna play Close to the Edge and and Yes album. And then they played the Yes album, and then instead of playing, no, they played Close to the Edge, didn't they? Yeah. It was in this era of shows where bands were going on tour and saying, "We will play this album." Front right, to right. Back. Yeah, Remember, yeah. That was a that was a good yeah. theme for a while. That was a cool thing. Yeah, it was fantastic. And, but they changed directions that night. They said they were going to play the Yes album, and they did not. They played some eighties. <laughs> Yes, album, I think. They played Going for the One. Oh, Going yeah. for the One is oh, great, yeah. man. That's not a, that's a that's great not a album. album. Yeah, I have that tape in my car. I want to hear the Yes album. <laughs> Every Yes album is great, except for Tornado, up through and including 90125. And then forget about it. Everything else is fucking dog shit. But, <laughs> but, but even drama, the one with the buggles is phenomenal. But I, I'll say that the, the most underrated is Relayer and the most overrated is Fragile. Uh, I would say Fragile is overrated. 
I could, I, I guess I could agree with that because it is held up to such high esteem, basically just because of Roundabout. But I do. It's think a it's great album. It's count. not in my top three yes albums, though. <laughs> okay, we're well, gonna keep enough. this going on another podcast <laughs> called, <laughs> called Prog Rock Corner. Yeah, yeah. Atri- yeah, answering all your prog. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure this is what people want. You know, you barely want to listen to the music, let alone us talk about stuff that's not this record. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so Keith Emerson, Greg Lake, they're both playing in semi-successful bands in the late '60s, and they meet up at a gig in San Francisco at the Fillmore in 1969. Emerson is ready to get out of the nice. He's tired of it. Greg Lake is unsatisfied with King Crimson. He wants out for whatever reason. I think it's because Fripp made him change from guitar player to a bass player. That old chestnut of a story. (laughs) (laughs) They decide Emerson pitches Lake, who is three years younger than him. And I always like to look at these ages, because I think when you're in your 20s, obviously three years can make a big difference. And we're going to get to Carl Palmer next, who is yet another three years younger than Greg Lake. But the pitch for the band from Keith Emerson is creating the maximum emotional effect with the minimal amount of people. Right. And so they then they agreed they wanted to work together in 1969 when they met and pretty much shortly assembled the band. They I did read an interesting anecdote that there were some early discussions to recruit Mitch Mitchell and Jimi Hendrix to make it a foursome, but that ultimately didn't come together. So instead they found a guy, young guy, playing in a band called Atomic Rooster. His name was Carl Palmer. Now, now, Rob, did you catch what their original band name was going to be? No, I didn't. What was that, Marty? Oh, it was going to be uh, Seahorse. That's not bad, actually. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't think about it until you were just talking, but they are the prog rock CSN. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Trying to keep their solo careers alive. <laughs> yeah, like three guys whose bands wouldn't have them because they were such dildos, so they could only have each other. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and they wanted they wanted the world to know their specific names, right? So it was it was it was right around the same time as CSN formed up, and I think some of the impetus for the the name they chose was kind of similar, which is they believed that they should be equal. They should be equal partners. Even though Keith Emerson was definitely the most famous and successful of the group, it sounds like he controlled a fair amount of of what happened. But so it wasn't the first supergroup, but it was an early supergroup. I was going to say that supergroup title. Uh, it seems a little stretched here to say that they're a supergroup. I'm not saying that the Nice were dog shit or anything like that, or Atomic Rooster were dog shit. But I certainly don't think that you could say that you take three guys from bands of middling popularity and put them all together and it becomes a super group, right? Wait, King Crimson was not middling. What are you talking about? King Crimson is the only one that has any claim to be like an actual. But Emerson was more famous. I think these guys, it really depends. Everyone seems to have a very subjective view of what super group means. Is it just, you know, a recognizable names? Is it people with the power and potential to play like virtuosos? Because these guys, I think, were a super group in that it was it was a lot of flesh and dazzle. Yeah. Well, they were also known because I think this brings us to our favorite segment of the podcast, by the numbers. So I'm going to tell you why they count as a supergroup very shortly. First number I want to throw out to you guys is 600,000. That's the number of attendees at the Isle of Wight Festival in August of 1970, which doubled as Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's second ever gig. So getting booked on this festival was no small feat. They clearly had some clout to throw around, whether it was Emerson, Lake, or Palmer. You can debate amongst yourselves. It was not Palmer. If you want to hear that gig, it just was posted on a blog, which is fantastic. I visit it daily, called Albums, not Albums That Never Were. I'll have it for you by the end of the show, but it's it's a it's a crucial blog to get stuff like this. You can download the entire the entire concert act by act. It was a crazy lineup, and so huge surprise. Okay, first thing, the Isle of Wight Festival was staged somewhat as a response to the very successful Woodstock Festival from the summer before in America, right? But huge surprise, it was plagued with sound problems, logistical issues, including, not the least of which, transporting 600,000 concertgoers to an island with a normal population of 100,000. But get this, the, yeah, the lineup as Dave is telling us, was insane. Probably this is worth a listen. Hendrix played and then was dead within three weeks of playing the gig. It's his last British appearance. And by all accounts, he was not good. Uh, And Pete Townsend talks about how he, it was a wake up call for him seeing Hendrix that night. It inspired him to clean up his act. So, 
just back to the supergroup thing, just check out the order of acts for ELP's day. It went as follows in order Joni Mitchell, Tiny Tim, Miles Davis, 10 years after, then ELP comes on, then The Doors, then The Who, then Sly and the Family Stone, and to close out the night, of course, Melanie. <laughs> we all know and love. That's crazy. Is that I got a brand new yeah, pair of roller nuts. skates, girl? That's Is that Melanie? <laughs> okay. We're going to move on to the next number, which is 3,000. 3,000 pounds, or a ton and a half. That's the weight of Carl Palmer's stainless steel drum set. As you know, prog rock drummers are known for having some ridiculous gear surrounding them. In particular, Carl got it into his head that a stainless steel drum kit would be perfect for sound projection, but after they assembled it, they realized it was much too heavy to be practical in any way, shape, or form, and they measured it at 1.5 tons when it was in the road cases. In fact, there's an anecdote about them having to cancel a Roanoke, Virginia show after the stage collapsed under the weight of the kit. He said that he got British steel to make it, and they said, do you want the shells a quarter inch thick or a half inch thick? And he said, a ha- of course, a half inch thick. And then realized that his 26 inch bass drum weighed like 400 pounds. <laughs> Which so like- if that's not prog rock excess, I don't know what is. Have you guys seen the picture of the entire road crew, all the buses and every everything in their employ when they were at the peak of their touring prowess? It's nuts. It's like a small, it's a small nation. Seems Seems insane. And... Well, just moving right along, though, I I wanted to mention that the drum kit got sold to a private citizen, I think once Carl realized it was impractical, but then ended up later being sold to one Ringo Starr. So possible Ringo still has it in storage somewhere, unclear, but... Ringo definitely needs that 36-piece kit. He's just moving all over that bad boy. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Okay, got a couple more numbers for you. The next number is seven. It's been alluded to, but that's the number of movements in the Tarkus Suite, which takes up the entire first side of this album. It's a full 20 minutes, 43 seconds long. Next number I want to throw out to you is 17. That's the number of edits that are in that Tarkus Suite, according to Carl Palmer. The band could not get the whole thing in one take, despite what they tried, or they weren't satisfied with the takes in any case, so they had did have to stitch it together. It's what even the most professional of professionals do. And the last number I want to tell you about, Dave already mentioned it, number one on the UK charts. This album reached number one. It was extremely popular. And it is hard to conceptualize the world <laughs> that that is. So the initial reason for, for its popularity is a huge contingent of record stores in Israel reporting high numbers because uh, the rabbinical culture misread the title as Tuchis. <laughs> <laughs> and with good. that delicious pun i want to make a plea to you guys to help us get better help us learn more by sharing our podcast with a friend share 1001 album complaints with a friend or another music obsessive like like us like you or in one of the many prog rock subreddits you frequent we know you do so please get this out there get us yelled at get us corrected get people angry at us we love it we want to learn more we love hate mail we take it into our hearts and it makes us grow stronger. <laughs> and I want to remind you all, too, that we're about to do a listener request month. So we're kind of nearing the end of the time when your requests can come in. But please send them our way. We're tallying those votes. We've already got a lot of awesome feedback. You can send it over to us over email. You can put it on Instagram, whatever you want to do. But in November, we're going to be doing all listener requests. So we hope you get your votes in early and often. And I want to also add to what you said, which is that, you know, this is something, you know, a a very quick request that's dropped. And a lot of people don't think twice about it. But these guys work their asses off to get these shows to you. And they're free of charge. So it's no skin off your back to just do the quick thing that he asked you to do. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate it. You're right. It does take a fair amount of work. But okay, let's keep going. Let's talk about the rest of ELP's story leading up to Tarkus. So they play that Isle of Wight show in August of 1970. They keep gigging successfully through the end of the year, and they set aside. And I should have mentioned, they made their first record right before the Isle of Wight show. So after they start going out on the road, they then set aside January to record their follow-up. You know, also, I think it's hard for us. We, we always deal with this when of bands of this era, but they're just turning out material so quickly. 
I don't know, the record companies, the record buying public, it just seems like it was such a fertile time. So, you know, within six months of their first record coming out, they're back in the studio wanting to get this uh, another record out. They set aside January to record the entire album, but unfortunately spend the entire month on only the Tarkus suite. So it bleeds into February. They spend February on side two. All this is being done at a place called Ad Vision Studios in London where a lot of great records were made, but a couple I pulled out were Man Who Sold the World and the aforementioned Yes album. It's called Ad Vision because it was originally for voiceovers and jingles. So I suppose this was also a time when a lot of these old commercial studios were being repurposed for musicians to come in. Again, the business model was sort of shifting. Kind of an exciting time. I wanted to also point out that Greg Lake actually quit the band during this period because when Emerson first explained to him, if it can be explained, his idea for this Tarkus suite, this armadillo tank that gets birthed in a volcano and fights manticores along a long road. Greg Lake said, I, I'm not into this. You, you should leave this for your solo work. But somehow the management team convinced him to come back and, and join the band once again. So like already there's turbulence in this band leading up to this recording. One of the things that's the most telling about this record, and I think this is from a very real place, is Lake wrote all the lyrics. So, you know, if you want to blame someone for an actual character named Aquatarchus, which is, <laughs> <laughs> then it's yeah. Lake that you're blaming, not Emerson. Emerson just had the 10 8s time signatures. So he's bloated in a different way, but really it's Lake. So the very telling aspect of this is there's one outtake from this record. Do you guys do you guys know about this? No. There's only one outtake, and uh, I believe it was called "Oh My Father," and Lake's dad had just passed away, and it was you know a vulnerable look at his dad, and that was deemed too personal to go on a record. Where think of how many? I mean, as a perform as an artist, is what what you want is the personal revealing, not the armadillo tank, right? So it's, that's an interesting fact that I think is a tell-all, probably. I got to say, it's not like you weren't already experiencing subject matter whiplash on this album right. anyway. It could have fit in easily with the, way, with the rest of the songs on side B. It's, you know, it has nothing to do with an armadillo tank fighting a yeah. manticore or whatever the hell they're talking about in this. Is the manticore that elephant carcass-looking thing yeah. that is dead on the cover? Oh, nice. Okay. There's almost no concept albums that are fully cohesive concept albums. One of the great joys, I think, of rock operas as in general is that you could have these grand sweeping concept records that you could fully explain, not notwithstanding Tarkus, but then halfway through climbing that particular mountain, almost every songwriter runs out of steam and fills side two with bullshit. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. a good point. And since we're blaming Greg Lake, I think I should mention now that he gets sole production credit as well. Wow. So that, that is something to yeah. think about. I was surprised by that. What about Eddie Offord? I don't have the vinyl in front of me, but I looked at all the other ELP records, and Greg Lake consistently gets production credit and gets listed. For some reason, he was... It got handed to him. It doesn't seem like uh, Emerson wanted. Eddie Offord was the engineer. Okay, okay. And that's what Are You Ready, Eddie, is. And by the way, there's that that delicious subgenre of song, which is the, see, uh, see, we can let our hair down and drop our talents to a relatable level, you earthbound dweebs will finally understand. <laughs> like that yes. that whole thing is like, yeah, we can rock. Like, uh, that's how Frank Zappa saw rock and roll. He would play these denigrating fuck you kind Covers of Louie Louie. Yeah, sometimes for the whole set, I believe. Yeah, when, yeah. He really, when he really wanted to punish you for liking uh, <laughs> pop music. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, nice guy. Okay, so this was ultimately released in June 1971. Like we said, it sold well. It was certified gold 500K uh, pretty quickly in the UK. We mentioned that the engineer was Eddie Offred, who they reference in one of the songs we're going to talk about. I wanted to point out that his other credits were engineering, yes. Makes perfect sense, right? Same studio. And then later, he engineered and produced a 311 record. Oh, no. So quite a storied career. Not a lot in between, unfortunately. By the way, since we have so many Yes fans here, uh, you guys want to help me realize my lifelong ambition of starting a Yes cover band that does covers only in Vanilla Fudge style called Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. 
let's i think it's time to play some more music we've been talking it up quite a bit we have a lot to tackle all right let's play a little more of the tarkus suite and sometimes we make the joke that these songs don't change and so we could be playing the same clip twice that's definitely not the case here in this 21 minute opus so we're gonna drop it in somewhere else Has the dawn ever seen your eyes? Have the days made you so unwise? Realize you are. Had you told? of guys think about this song how do you parse this song it's in seven sections the first of which is eruption it ends with aqua tarkus i can't differentiate the sections i tried there's one <laughs> there's one i could pick out battlefield because they talk about the battlefield but some of the other ones i'm just like I don't, know, I don't know yeah there's sort of the two greg lake sections that somewhat bookend it meaning where he's singing so there's eruption that's got the heavy bass intro I heard another podcast called An Embarrassment of Prague. Shout out to those guys. They called this opening salvo Planet of the Apes human catching music, which felt spot on to me. You mean the uh the uh that part that brings it in or or the section following that? I or- mean the part where the where the bass kicks in real heavy and it's like it sounds like a 70s cop theme. That that whole thing, yeah, yeah. Mm, that that yeah, whole yeah, thing yeah, is yeah. called eruption, and then it settles into a slower section where Greg Lake is actually singing. That's called Stones of Years, and then it kind of goes back and forth. There's a couple more sections, and when Greg Lake's voice comes back in, it's, it's called Battlefield. Just so you guys know, no, I've had this record for decades, and I have a very dynamic relationship with it which is you know initially i thought it was uh, a bloated embarrassment and over the years it's changed so i understand every side of the fence on this because i don't know where i stand on it until i'm listening to it that day okay well i'm definitely more on the bloated embarrassment side right now (laughs) but listen i don't i don't want to bury the lead i do think there's some cool stuff here there's some parts of the songs i like it's the cohesion it's wanting to listen to this whole song suite at once there's a lot of there's high highs and there's low lows and it's the cohesion that i'm really complaining about the lyrics they've already been brought out but the lyrics feel right out of a middle school notebook has the dawn ever seen your eyes have you walked on the stones of years when you speak is it you that hears wait hold on hold on you gotta you gotta quote the one line about the holocaust though that's it. That's in a different tune. Oh, I'm just saying, just as a lyric writer, that guy will just go into a what the fuck? Definitely some some hard right turns. <laughs> yeah, I will say I thought that the be- opening salvo of this song put me in the mind, and maybe it's just because I'm familiar with the album cover of like a tank tread rolling. That it had a sense of like a juggernaut moving forward. And I thought that that was a really cool musical motif, but it wasn't strong enough to carry the entire song. And I mean, they changed it up a whole lot. I feel like at 745, it's like they drop into like Willie the Pimp. That yes. uh, Frank Zappa yeah. song or something like that. It's like, where the hell did this come from? This is so out of left field. Yeah, that's the, that's when the cock rock comes in. It had the feeling of Zappa. <laughs> It is, all of a sudden, yeah. All of a sudden, it's more cowbell. <laughs> One cool thing to know is that that specific section, the, 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 is the very germination of the entire record. And so what happened was 
Palmer backstage on the first album tour would be playing in his practice drum pad. He'd be playing those fills. And Emerson heard that and had a Reese's peanut butter cup moment where he's like, I got some shit to throw onto that that I think is going to work. Except they didn't talk with that specific New York accent. But that, <laughs> yeah, so that everything was born from that. So I agree that that part is really cool. I think as a theme for a song, that makes sense to me. It's cohesive. Of course, I understand and have liked many super long song suite type songs in the past, but it's hard to follow what's going on in this song because they don't really return to any one part. And I get it. They were purposely breaking song structure convention in that sense. But Eruption, in, or that first section, is one of the sections I really like. I think it just kind of goes downhill as you're past like minute 12 the other thing that jumps out to me on this and i had to look a couple times because we didn't mention it yet you know marty mentioned there's no guitar player which feels like a very conscious choice but there is guitar on this track which is carl palmer playing like a gilmore-esque guitar section starting around 15 and a half minutes i didn't make it that far <laughs> it's and uh, unsurprisingly it's two solos layered on top of each other <laughs> well rob you said it goes downhill after about 12 minutes but when they get to, I think it's the mass part, or no, Battlefield, which is the about like 13 minutes in, that's where I actually really liked that the song. I thought that it finally got to a place where it was showing off Greg Lake's voice and he was given enough space to really emote and put some feeling behind it. And if that had just been a song of its own, I would have really liked it, but... I'm 13 minutes, and I got 13 minutes of baggage by the time I get to that, and it was kind of hard to get over that and say, well, I'm going to listen to the preceding 12 and a half minutes to get to this point, to get to this section that I actually really like. Well, uh, one thing that jumped out to me, I'm curious if you feel the same way, is what you said about giving him enough space to emote. I feel like they clear admirably for a powerhouse group that likes to f show off and show what they can do. They clear space for him. I feel like they really do. Yeah. Yes, I would agree. Yeah. Well, but speaking of emoting, there is space. I agree with that. And that requires taste and, and patience and reserve, which is admirable. But I thought what Tom was saying was about the, the melody. I like it when Greg Lake kind of has to push more and his melodies go mm -hmm. into that higher register where I think he does sound really good. And you hear it on the King Crimson stuff, certainly. You hear it in a couple places on this record, too, Better that I think are ultimately better, more successful songs than any one piece of this Tarkus suite. But at least in my recollection, maybe some of this passed by because it is a long track to get through. A lot of it's just kind of flat. It, you know what I mean? It melodically, it doesn't really pay off that well. The first two times that he sings in the song are very melodically boring. And that's where I was saying they needed a John Anderson to write a really compelling vocal melody. And also, correct me if I'm wrong, there's no harmony on this album, like at all, right? I don't, I don't think there's think any so. vocal harmony no. at all. And so if there's going to be no vocal harmony, the main melody line needs to be really damn good. And it's not for most of this song but i do think that he again he's given that opportunity to go up to push to give you a, a melody that could get in your head a little bit and i'm not saying everything has to be mariah carey but i like melodies that i can hum along to i think most of the universe would agree i just am sitting here in stunned awe that you guys don't see and experience the magic that i do when i hear that I'm I'm also curious. Are you guys Procol Harum fans? I was going to mention them when Rob said that Sar Sgt. Pepper's was the first prog rock band. I had heard a, a someone and somewhere say that that Procol Harum was the first kind of concept kind of prog rock band. I'm not sure if that's what you're going to say or not. Well, I mean, there's a stately regalness to the churchly organ and the way that Greg Lake feels like a wise man of the ages has a similar Gary Brooker thing uh, that they bring to the table. So I just didn't know. I For me, the first three or four Procol Harum records are majestic and have that, you know, really pull off that like uh, churchly sage thing that he seems to be going for. I don't know if that's if that's what, what was intended. Yeah, fair enough. I just think it felt like it needed a little more of an editor. And let me cite one more timestamp that I'd love to hear you defend, Dave, which is when the, the duck fart solo comes in. 
at the end around 1810? Yeah. So what you're talking about is Aquitarchus, which I was initially calling like elephant bellows. And, and then I realized, wait, that's the Aquitarchus thing. So nothing was connecting as far as story wise for me, but I love it. I just, it's farty synths that plays some spacey shit. And then Carl doles out these martial rhythms that eventually buttress that shit so it doesn't sound like Clown Town. I just think that duck fart tone has not <laughs> aged very well. Some of the synth tones do sound alien and otherworldly and still kind of fresh. You alluded to it, and I know I can't think of the timestamp, but there is one section that begins with what sounds like an elephant army signaling yeah. they're, they've just reached the city that they're about to siege or something. You know, it's a very metallic sound. I don't think we have to worry about timestamps because no one in their right <laughs> mind's going to be going back and forth in a 23-minute song. But duck fart soloing. <laughs> I, listen, I did hear uh, Keith Emerson, to his credit, was an early adopter of the Moog synthesizer. He got an early prototype from Moog, and he was one of the people who helped take it from a novelty sound into a real something a real quote unquote real pianist would want to use and and use on stage but those early prototypes they said were really challenging to use they would constantly be going out of tune they required you to plug and unplug to set up any sound it was very laborious and he said half the time he'd be playing a solo with his right hand and he'd be effectively tuning it with his left hand at the same time when he was on stage apparently the guys uh, beaver and kraus were really proficient with it so they did a lot of sessions uh, but yeah that thing was like it was trying to it was like trying to ride like a 700 pound uh, bull well now that we've done side one of Tarkus, let's flip it over and see what they have to equal the energy and ambition of the Tarkus suite let's go to track one on side two it's called jeremy bender In the evening sun Laid him down in a bed of roses Finally decided to become a nun Talked with the sister and spoke in a whisper Threatened a fister if she didn't come clean By the way, they sound like they're reluctantly going into this side <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like an afterthought. Let's go for, on this epic journey on this land of armadillo tanks to Jeremy Bender, a song about a, a fisting nun yeah. that's under two minutes long. <laughs> yeah, pick a fucking lane, guys. 19 minutes down to two minutes. Come yeah, on. Let's just uh, <laughs> hang out in the music hall zone for a couple minutes. It's a riff on Oh Susanna, too, which was... It just feels so corny. But Jeremy Bender is probably gender bender. And I do <laughs> like that at least it feels like a lyrical uh, cross-dressing tip of the hat to Sid Barrett from Arnold Lane. Hmm. Well, I mean, these lyrics, how could you not get sucked in by it? Talk to a sister, spoke in a whisper, threatened a fister if she didn't come clean, jumped on the mother just like a brother, asked one another if the other is a queen. I... Now that you're talking about it being gender bendery, I guess I get it, but that also sounds like there's some weird interfamilial sexual tension going on, which I don't think I'm quite down with. I want to point out, you Rob, you mentioned that this is a riff on Oh Susanna at 3 minutes and 36 seconds into the song. Emerson on the piano quotes that song Turkey in the Straw 
It's like the ice cream truck song. He like does that little. That's his fist and motif. It's exactly. It's the turkey and the straw, baby. Yeah, well, probably those songs were written at around the same time, right? They're from a similar era of of uh, piano play, ragtime piano. He does a lot of that shit where he just he'll start playing like Yankee Doodle Dandy in the middle of a solo. It's like, ah, oh, please don't do that. Yeah. That's like Yes doing America, though. <laughs> oh, well, that's mm, I don't know. Yes's version of America is pretty good. That's a good version. I love that. I think you get kind of one of these tunes per record, Max, and we all know how the record ends. And so this <laughs> yeah. one really undermines their seriousness. It it also gives me the bends because it's so different. We've already talked about that. And for someone who is reporting himself to be such a pioneer, you know, they talk about Emerson playing the organ like a guitar. He's got this like Hendrix-esque relationship with the organ where he's always messing with it or trying to break it or break new sonic ground sticking knives in it turning speakers getting feedback out of the hammond and flying around and flying around all that crazy stuff and then to go to this as your side two opener it just seems bizarre to me yeah like what is the audience for this song the people who listened to side one of tarkas and loved it and then they flip the record and you're like well, I'm going to give you the exact opposite of what you just loved. If you made it through that 20 minute long epic, we're going to give you something right. that is completely the opposite of it. You're going to be like, oh, well, what the fuck, man? I just like that. I dare you to find me them doing this song live at any point <laughs> in their entire career. I think this is their way of communicating that they know how to let their hair down and have fun as well. But across the pond, it just it once it gets here, it's like a game of telephone. And by the time it reaches us, we're like, what the fuck is wrong with you guys yeah and it's not it, the message comes out different over here or something i agree and i like the theory of the letting your hair down hey we're just people too we're the audience too we're not so different from you but i think that's how the last song is intended to function as well and it would do yeah. its job much better if this song wasn't at least in this position in the sequence because it's not like you're going to get a whole side of Jeremy Bender-esque jams. I don't think you need any. I don't think you need one, two or one. I think it shatters an illusion that doesn't need shattering. Yeah, fair enough. Before we get off of this song, I, I have to mention, I feel so compelled to mention this. They are such good musicians. The claps that they do over this song are so bad and so out of time. There are multiple occasions where one of the claps is a good quarter second late. There's like three people clapping and one of the claps is just a quarter second late multiple times. And you, you are absolutely God tier level musicians and you can't get fucking hand claps, right? It's not like they're doing a crazy pattern or anything. It's like clap, 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 clap. And they fuck it up a bunch of times. I don't understand it. Probably because the concept is so beneath them that they... It's a <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's move on to the third song on the entire record. And this, this, is, my, this is my favorite track. I, I, I put it on as the highlight. I think it goes for just the right amount of time. It goes hard. I think I like it better when Emerson's playing piano. You could throw whatever epithets you want at me for that, but it's easier to hear his virtuosity when he's just playing piano. I love it. It's definitely my favorite song on the album. Yeah, same. It's more in the spirit of the Tarkus vibe. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that the motif of the opening motif of Tarkus is very reminiscent to the main motif of this song. And they had to have been aware of that, right? I can't imagine that they didn't hear that sure. as well. Like I heard that and I was like, oh, this sounds very, very similar, but very cool. Like I, I definitely dig this album a lot. And again, Greg Lake's voice is given room to breathe and to sound really good and get that kind of crunchy top of his range yeah. style that is where he lives the best. And also your your main criticism that side one lacked focus, you know, I think Bitches Crystal is where you take the good parts or the, the best features um, irrefutably of side one, but you actually put focus and structure into it. I agree. And they do do that a couple other times, but ultimately I, I think this one's the best. I heard Emerson mention that he was thinking of the Drave Brubeck track called Countdown, Yeah, which I listened to. You can kind of get it. It's in a different time. 
it sort of works, but but then on top of that, in, or in addition to what you just said, is the the full concept was to do a boogie woogie part with a six eight time signature that uh, right. that was featured in the Brubeck song. So in essence, it's taking those wildly different uh, impulses to do "Are You Ready, Eddie?" and Tarkus and conjoining them in one song conceptually. Exactly, because the. Because the countdown tune has the boogie woogie eight to the bar, like bass bass line. And this does a similar thing, but in six eight. Right. I will say it, my note on this is that when he does the piano solo, it sounds like he's listening to a completely different track than the rest of the band and trying to solo over it. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but it is a bizarre choice of a piano solo. It does seem like as a player, he's really trying to avoid making it sound sweet sort of ever. Yes. Yeah, he gets, it's like it makes him uncomfortable. So then he goes real dissonant, or or tunes the Moog out of tune, or you know does something weird, yeah. just jams the keys, yeah, just eschewing chord tones. I feel like that's a British thing. I feel like there's some crim- early Crimson stuff where the piano solers are, are are just the piano player banging on the keys obnoxiously. There's I don't know if you guys ever listened to the Soft Machine. Hell yeah, the Soft Machine kind of ha- have solos that are just real nasty and gnarly and. I don't, I don't know if it's a British thing or, or what, or if, if that was their answer to like jazz or. <laughs> I think they're just like chord tones are too easy, man. Well, they had a really a really fertile late sixties, early seventies jazz scene in in England. Another group was Nucleus. Man, they had a cra- a really cool run. If you guys like that kind of thing, but Soft Machine that really devolved into a bunch of guys jagging off on stage together. But while while <laughs> Wyatt was in the band and Kevin Ayers, I mean that is a super group. Okay, well we we agree. Bitches Crystal is successful. Blind Faith is not a super group. Moving on, sorry. <laughs> Can we just point out? I don't think I realized this until today when I actually wrote the title "Bitches Crystal" from Spotify. Is that it's not possessive. It's plural. Yeah. It's multiple bitches. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something I find very hilarious about that. Okay. There's some other good tracks on the second side, but we are going to go and round it out by discussing the last track on the album, which is called Are You Ready, Eddie? Are you ready? My note is, all of a sudden, it's a fucking meatloaf song out of nowhere, and I don't like it at all. It shouldn't be on the album. Look, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I think this is what Dave was talking about. This is the Let Your Hair Down song. This is the jokey last song that shows that they're capable of making simplistic blues-based pop music, and they're referencing the engineer, Eddie, and they're talking about the 16 tracks. It would work to me. It would be funny to end a heavy prog rock album this way if Jeremy Bender didn't exist on the record. Yeah, well, I don't know. I don't think you need this in any world. It's the same reason why, even though I'm a huge Dead fan, I wince every time they close their fucking shows with a Chuck Berry song. It's a skip every time for me. This belongs in only one place, as a CD-era secret track yeah, yeah. on the album. <laughs> that is the only wait, wait, place wait, after belongs. 30 minutes of silence. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, after yeah, 30 yeah. minutes of silence, yes. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I agree it's not a good song. I'm just saying I could have understood what they were going for with that jokey, letting their hair down approach if it was the only song like that on the record. But it's yeah, not. no. And this has that other example of where they're playing this. It's, you know, a Jerry Lee Lewis or Chuck Berry type number, or specifically it's inspired by a Little Richard tune called The Girl Can't Help It. The arrangement's almost directly based on that. But when, as soon as he starts soloing, he has to throw a lot of dissonance in there on the piano just to throw you off the scent. 
Yeah, because he's also telling us that although I can let my hair down and hang, I won't be hanging with you because I'm a lot more intelligent than you. <laughs> <laughs> cool guy, that Keith Emerson. Luckily, two two ELP uh, records have made the list. The second one, I believe, is a live performance of some an adaptation of a classical piece. So we have that to look forward to in our future. Uh, picture pictures of an exhibition, or is that? I think that's the one. Yeah, that's yeah. not a fun record. Uh, Love Beach is a fun record. You got to look at the cover of that record. That. 1978 when it wasn't hip anymore to have concepts and now they looked like the Bee Gees and they were hanging out on a beach <laughs> and singing songs about their penises and stuff. Oh my god, yeah. Right? Open shirts. It's a great Hello. album cover. <laughs> Welcome yeah. to chest the, the title track is a must here. Well, we will check that out. But I think <laughs> I'm not going to check that out by the way. <laughs> no, it's it's actually unironically no, legitimately good. I, I promise. Yeah. Okay, the rest okay. of the album, not so much. Okay. I think we've gabbed about Tarkus quite enough. We've given this armored armadillo enough of our time. Now it's time to throw it around the room and vote. Is this album a must listen before you die? We shall vote now, and I will throw the vote to Tom. Yeah, I'm going to go no on this one. I didn't have a particularly great time listening to this album. Minus the fact that I was like, oh, I got a whole bunch of snarky shit I can say about this album now. That was the only thing that brought me joy listening to the album. I don't feel like I have a better understanding of prog rock because of this. And uh, yeah, I I don't think that it was worth my time. So I'm going to give it a no. Sorry, Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Marty, what do you think? It's kind of sad that Greg Lake started off with Crimson and then just got sucked into the ELP. Even there, there was even a period where it was Emerson, Lake, and Powell. I don't know if you guys saw that. There's a little period of that. And then died of pancreatic cancer, you know? And, and like every his whole career is basically just, you know, revolved around Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. But I digress. Uh, no, this album does not belong on any top 1,000 album list that I would make maybe top 5,000 album list I would make. It surprises me that the uh, album by them called Trilogy, which I think came out right after this, is not on the list because that album actually is, is very well put together, very listenable to from beginning to end, uh, unlike this album. So yeah, my answer is a no. Dave, what say you? I knew you guys were going were gonna to jump on this record, and I, I knew how this was going to go, and uh, I knew which, what role I was going to play as well. And uh, I'm going to go down defending this record because not just contextually from a time where the miracle of this could not just happen, but happen in a big way. But to me, over time, it's grown. And while I do agree or did agree at, at other points in my life with everything I've heard tonight, ultimately, these days, I kind of cherish this record. But to me, it, it, it's, it falls apart a little bit in the second half. But I do love that suite now. And I, I used to fucking hate it. Excellent. Well, you got to hear it before you die. And if you don't, I'm going to kill I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have, well, we already have heard it, luckily. So listen, I have to vote no as well. I did enjoy many aspects of this. I do think some of the songs on the second side rip. I think parts of the Tark is sweet rip. But I think even from a glancing perspective, they're definitely titans of music. And so I am interested to dive a little deeper into some of the rest of the discography And I glanced at Trilogy and the first record, too. And yeah, it just seems like they had a slightly better editor to me. Not to mention the fact, we alluded to it, but the cover art of this, while seemingly iconic, it seems like it should be more notorious. Like, it looks like the kind of thing that design professors would throw up on the screen telling you exactly what not to do. Well, have you heard the the story behind it? The guy who did it, he had all these proofs that he was showing the guys, and they were like, nah... Nah, next. And then in the bottom, there was this doodle where he, he, it wasn't an idea to him. He was just doodling a fucking armadillo tank. And the guys were like, what the hell is that? Let's go with that. That tiny, stupid doodle in the margin right there. That's perfect. I did hear that, and that sounds about right. But anyway, <laughs> the question is not whether the question is not whether it has good stuff on it. It does have good stuff on it, and I think if you're a prog connoisseur, of course, dive in, listen to this, as well as maybe some of the other records. But for normal folk, it is not essential. I don't see where it points. I don't think not hearing it interrupts your understanding of the prog rock legacy too much. So it's a no for me. 
Sorry, ELP stands. We have decided against you. We have ruled. The council has ruled. And Dave, the lone voice of reason, has been overruled, sadly. But okay. Well, I think what we're going to do now is, as we wrap up the show... Oh, yeah. First, we're going to go to our listener mailbag. So I have that mailbag here at my homestead, and I'm going to reach in. The subject line of this one, before I even tell you who it's from, is disagree! Exclamation point. So we know we're in for a good one here. This is a, this is a woman called Diane. So for anyone who says we don't have female listeners, you're incorrect. Diane wrote us to tell us how much she disagrees with us. She's talking about the Tusk podcast, and she says, this is absolutely a must-listen album, especially because it came after Rumors. I've listened to this album before, now, and on your podcast. Buckingham is interesting and creative on many of the songs, but thank you for pointing out that he was listening to Talking Heads at the time. I do agree with that. Christy McVie is perfect. I love her voice. I think we complimented Christy McVie. And then she goes on to say, skip every Stevie song, which I think was pretty much the opinion of the group as well. 100%. Thank you to whoever said they didn't like her. This is from Diane. Anyway, thanks for the fun, Diane. Okay, thanks, Diane. We appreciate it. We appreciate your feedback. And I really, you know, I didn't actually participate in that Tusk episode, but I wanted to mention that listening as a listener, I it really helped me navigate the album because you guys were saying at the time that it was kind of like three solo projects smashed together. And so breaking it up into those solo projects, which we did, into mixes really helped me enjoy it more and gave it some new life for me. So, and I do like the Christine McVie stuff the best. Yeah, that's a heavy album. And I mean, just by sheer weight. Sure. There's, yeah. a, there's a lot, a lot to get on. through. <laughs> I also wanted to point out that Diane, who seems lovely, gave us her full phone number to, in case we wanted to call her back and um, address these comments. And I will be reading that out loud now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Okay. Uh, next one we have is Paul from Virginia writes, Hey guys, I enjoy the podcast. Have a few comments about the maggot brain discussion. Now we're digging deep into the into the archive. I don't even remember what we said about maggot brain at this point. Maybe someone else can help me, but... He mentions that Sir Knows is is the dancer in the group. He comes pretty close to being a contortionist. He plays no instruments. He dances around during the live show. It's hard not to watch. Very acrobatic. Band members are dancing. Dancers are dancing. George Clinton's walking around like a deranged band director. The crowd's chanting. It's a wild party. Although, so basically he's saying he loves Magaprame. He does mention that he cannot, in good conscience, defend the flatulence on Armageddon. But... <laughs> thinks that it fits with George Clinton's sense of humor, which is inherently sophomoric. So we appreciate the feedback on Maggot Brain. I'll have to go review that one. I don't even remember what the Sacred Scrolls say about our take on that. I feel like we liked it, but it might be a little bloated, kind of like this one. It has a Tarkus on it itself, I believe. Okay, I think if you want to send us your comments, good or bad, hate mail, teach us something about Emerson, Lake, and Palmer that we we didn't cover here uh, or about anything that we've covered in the past, please send all that over, any such missive, over to 1001 Album Complaints at Gmail. We'll be excited to read it, and maybe your email will be read on the air. And now the only thing left to do is to throw it to Tom to tell us what our homework is for this week. All right. Thank you very much. I have the Albinator here. It has just finished defeating some kind of whale machine gun hybrid beast, and it is emerging triumphant, wearing the skin of its fallen enemies to tell us what the album for next week is going to be. So without any further ado, drum roll, please. We will be listening to... Another noted prog rock album. It is Doggy Style by Snoop Doggy Dog. Slight chains of pace. <laughs> Interestingly enough, there's actually a uh, song that is an Emerson, Lake, and Palmer outtake on there. It's called The Shiznit. <laughs> Some of their later works, yes. The Shiznit is the, is the absolute best Snoop Dogg song of all time. I love that fucking song. Well, all right. That is going to be a, a, definite mood, a definite mood shifter for this week. So we encourage you all to listen along with us. Dave from Discography, thank you so much for coming on, giving us the benefit of your ELP wisdom. We're excited to have you back in the future. Everybody, go check out Discography. Dave puts in the work. 
these epic interviews and these deep dives into bands. It's a really cool way to think about a band's catalog and look at them, as Dave said, from a bird's eye view. And we're on all the social media platforms, but especially on Facebook, our group Discography Soldiers of Sound is a very active one, meaning there's like 15, 20 posts a day, tons of, you know, there's nothing, nothing worse than a dead Facebook group. So come join the party. And you guys too, if you ever want to, free advertising, you guys have a show that, you know, the entire audience would eat up for sure. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, we'll have all Dave's links, the discography links in the show notes. Go check them out. You can find them where all fine, fine podcasts are purveyed, as well as that Facebook group. But okay, we are going to close the show out now for 1001 Album Complaints. I have been Rob. I've been Tom. I'm Marty. I'm Dave. Boosh. Boosh.